Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, Kieran O'Connor. What are the historical roots of political polarization in America? How did the very founding of the country set the stage for where we are now? Why do Americans hold such clashing perspectives on the meaning of our core ideals? And how might we as a country understand our history so as to shape a future that truly pursues a more perfect union? These are some of the questions at the center of a new book called American Schism, How the Two Enlightenments Hold the Secret to Healing Our Nation by Seth Radwell. Seth is a business executive, a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and clearly a lifelong student of history who's decided to share his learnings and impressions in this new book. Seth, welcome to the podcast. Kieran, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's our pleasure. Before we jump into the book, I want to hear a little bit more about why you decided to write this book. I mean, you're a business guy who's clearly interested in history, and you've written this massive book with so many fresh insights that are really giving people new ideas about the history of America. How did this come to be? Well, you're right. My whole career has been in business. I, I was most recently uh, CEO of various consumer products brands, uh, Proactive and others, and I took a three-year hiatus to work on this research project. And I think what led me to it was two things, Kieran. One was the first, I had, over the past couple of years, I had noticed how there had been a complete collapse in my view of our political discourse. And you know, as a student of history and politics, I did get a degree in public policy. I've always been interested and felt that discussing political issues is really important for our democracy. And that with, without that, we, we can't really have a flourishing democracy. But I think that the, the real turning point for me was over the past couple of years watching as what seemed to be the, the pursuit of objective truth, which is one of the foundations of modern society, seemed to be disappearing. In other words, everybody seemed to have their own truth. And when I would, at a, I would be at a cocktail party with business associates who I, over the course of my career, have had the benefit of meeting thousands, and I love to discuss politics, but yet I noticed nobody wanted to go there. Politics had become like a third rail. And these were really smart people, but for fear of bringing on the wrath or the acrimony of some group, they would put their head in the sand. And I think there was, a, there was a, an aha moment where I said, if we're gonna give democracy to our kids, it's gotta change. And so I embarked on what became a, very, a quite interesting journey, which became American Schism. So you started looking into the history of the United States in the hopes that what you learn might help us think about the present and the future. So right. let's start with the title. What is the American Schism? Well, the American Schism is a, a split, a, a break that happened at, at our founding. And the premise, by the way, of my, tr of my, of my journey was that I believe we see all these problems around us today and Americans are largely caught in two bubbles. One is we talk about this partisan bubble all the time, you know, people getting news or from one source and, and, and being in an echo chamber. And I think that's true. But I would argue as important as the partisan bubble, we're also caught in a time bubble, meaning that we don't really understand how we got here. And my hypothesis going in here was that the types of divisions and acrimony we see today in society have roots and antecedents. So I went back to uh, our founding, actually, which was, of course, during the Enlightenment. And, and the American schism is actually this, this very, very uh, vigorous break between two contending schools of what America should be. And the schism had, on one side, people like uh, um, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams and George Washington. And on the other side, uh, people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Paine. And these two groups had an incredibly different vision, which, which is really important. Now, 
in the book, I argue that those divisions back then actually are the antecedents. They're the roots of some of our problems today. And so in essence, the book not only sets up this schism back at our founding, but traces it through history. So how would you characterize those two schools of thought? Well, it's, it's great. You know, one of the parts of my research was working with uh, some professors of history and political science, and one in particular, Jonathan Israel, uh, who's an expert on the Enlightenment, has a framework for the Enlightenment, which he calls you know, the moderate versus radical Enlightenment. So the, the first point I think it's important for your listeners to understand is that Sometimes we forget or we take for granted how important the Enlightenment was for the founding of our country. You know, the word, the word Enlightenment itself has fallen out of favor. And what I try to describe to, to people who are interested is to really appreciate how incredible not only the last 200 years of American history has been, but where we've come from. If you just look at a couple of objective stats, I mean, 200 years ago in 1800, life, I'm sorry, in, yeah, let's say 1810, life expectancy was 30 years. Now it's over 70 years, right? At that same time, 200 years ago, one in five children didn't survive till age five. And today almost all do, right? So, I mean, on objective measures of human flourishing, we've made tremendous progress. And that's largely due to the framework of modern society, which is fact-based, called, which was the enlightenment. Um, the way Jonathan Rauch, a, a writer, describes it is that we've started building this constitution of knowledge, which has led us to, to flourish. Now, so that was the backdrop. Now, on the political spectrum, this is where the schism comes in. At the time of the Enlightenment, the, the, there was the, the way we talked about society was in, in the terms of what was called a social contract. The great social contract writers, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, John Rousseau, they they argued about like what why do uh, people come together to form a society and what's the basis of that and what are the fundamental rights that that a society that a government has to ensure so these were fundamental questions that influenced our founders now what was the break so the, the what i call the radical enlightenment thomas jefferson thomas paine uh they and benjamin franklin they all spent a lot of time in france and were very influenced by the french radicals the French Enlightenment, whereas the, John Adams and Alexander Hamilton and Washington were much more influenced by the, the British, the Locke and some of the British uh, enlighten, Enlighteners, Scottish Enlighteners. So what the, the two, the, obviously, when you're dealing with so many different points of view in political history and political viewpoint, there are many differences. But to me, I boil it down to two fundamental differences that created the schism. And, and I'll explain it this way. Number one, Radicals believe that the only legitimate form of government in a republic, in a, in a co social contract, was a representative democracy, a government of the people, bottom up. Whereas the moderates, in contrast, people like John Adams and Alexander Hamilton, they eschewed democracy. I mean, for, for them, the model was an aristocratic republic where the people who govern were leaders, the elite, like themselves. So the whole model for how government works, in fact, which is kind of a fundamental point, was radically different between these two camps. And I can go into it in more detail, but fundamentally this notion of a bottom-up representative democracy versus egalitarian versus kind of an institutional aristocratic republic, which was much more the British model, uh, that was the first big difference. The second difference that I, that's worth mentioning is that the radicals, especially the French radicals, had documented how for centuries in Europe, the monarchy had colluded with the church to keep the people oppressed. And so it was, they came up with this notion of separating the civic arena from the faith-based arena, the separate, what we now call the separation of church and state, which is pretty fundamental. And that was the, the, the radical enlightenment idea. The, the moderates were much more uh, open to religion playing a role, a, a formal role in society. I mean, I think all enlighteners and many believe that faith was important, but it was a separate realm. So uh, those are the two core differences. Now, they, the, our founders locked horns on these. And one of the things I do in the book 
Kieran, is I trace the period of time from the Declaration of Independence in 1776, which was very much a radical enlightenment view. Fast forward 12 years to the Constitution, which is a much more moderate document. So there was a big pendulum swing from this kind of radical egalitarian view in 76, the spirit of 76, to this much more uh, controlled compromise constitution, which has strong guardrails against democracy in 1787. And the reason why I chronicle in the book that transition is because it turns out that this swing back and forth between these two poles has characterized our entire history. And I, I actually trace five or six episodes of our history using that as a framework. Hmm. Well, it's interesting because obviously with the crafting of the, the constitution, both the moderates and the radicals had to arrive at a document that they could both accept and, and agree right. on the same words. And yet I imagine there are fundamental differences in how the two camps define and understand those very words, those very founding ideals, liberty, freedom, equality, tolerance, progress, right. freedom exactly. of religion, freedom of its speech, et cetera. Um, I guess, is there sort of a, a fundamental difference between how the moderates and the radicals would understand uh, the concept of liberty, let's say? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, well, in the sense that, you know, the Jeffersonian kind of radical egalitarian view was very much about decentralized government, government being local. And, and you know, so, in, in, it's so ironic that J Jefferson's legacy, which is so, so complex and so fascinating for many reasons, is, is embraced by what today are libertarians who believe, you know, stay out of my way, where freedom and liberty are the fundamental rights. Whereas the moderates recognize, I mean, th this is why this shift is so important. Uh, so uh, the moderates recognize we needed some problem solving in government. Like, let me, let me characterize it this way. 1776, Br we're breaking away from Britain. There's a radical spirit about these ideals he got uh, freedom, equality, all men are created equal, the Declaration of Independence. It's an it's a idealist document. It's, it's a wonderful credo. But after the war's over, a couple of years later, what happens? Well, now these 13 very diverse colonies need to work together to create, for example, a foreign policy. As a new nation, we needed allies. We can't have 13 colonies talking to France. So we needed a foreign policy. We needed a system of commerce across the colonies. We needed, for example, an ability to, to raise an army as Shays Rebellion right after, you know, before the constitution showed us. So my point being, there were practical concerns on the ground that the Articles of Confederation, which was our initial uh, document, our charter, weren't, was nowhere near resolving. So, so what happened was the pragmatists, the compromisers, the, the kind of geniuses like Alexander Hamilton, who was a genius, stepped in and devised solutions. And so, so that was much more of the moderate model. Now, the interesting part of the constitution specifically is you have a figure like James Madison, who was so instrumental because he was the, he was the figure that was going back and forth between this, you know, Jefferson, he was a Jefferson protege. So he was very sympathetic to this decentralized, more radical and egalitarian view of the country. But he also was working closely with Alexander Hamilton and recognized the need for institutions, for structures. So Madison is, it's fascinating from a personality perspective. Madison is kind of the, the broker of, and he, he, of course, he wrote much of the constitution. It, and, and one of the reasons accordingly, Kieran, that the Federalist Papers has become such an important document in our history is because Madison and Hamilton in the Federalist Papers actually argue for how the, the ultimate constitution is a combination of elements from this radical view and, and from this mo more moderate view. So like Federalist 10 and 51, you know, Madison is laying all this out, which is why the Federalist Papers are such an important document in political science. Right. Well, it's interesting because I'm seeing elements of both left and right in both the moderate and the radical uh, camps. So it, it's it's interesting to think about how our sort of uh, current uh, 
ideological divide maps onto that original schism. Because if you yeah. think about the idea of egalitarianism, it obviously appeals to a lot of leftist ideals. Um, but decentralization and localism appe right. appeals to a lot in, in libertarianism. And there's certainly a lot of uh, modern incarnations of the left that really believe we need an active right. centralized government to realize the to realize idea well, of so you're egalitarianism. Hitting, yeah. Kieran, you're hitting on the core point. The reason the book tracks this through history is because the way it played out in some ways it is, is quite surprising. Uh, exa exactly what you're saying, this this notion, and so I'll give one example. I mean, the period of Reconstruction after the Civil War was such, it was one of the main chapters. And the reason why that's so important is because on one hand, you have this plan where the federal government is taking it upon itself to instill this egalitarian ideal of everyone having a voice. And yet, Ultimately, Reconstruction fails under the auspices of local control because right. the South wants to control its destiny. So, I mean, some of the figures that I point out in the book are startling. After the after the the uh, the, the Reconstruction amendments were ratified by 1870, 1865, 68, around 85 percent of African Americans in the in the Southern states were voting, former slaves. When Reconstruction fails and the South takes back control of their destiny and, uh, and, and really kicks the, the, the federal overseers out, by eight to 10 years later, by 1878, around 5% of African Americans were voting. Now, that was the combination of a legal structure. The South reinstituted these black codes. Where they were the precursors to Jim Crow laws. But of course, there was also a terrorist organization that the Ku Klux Klan that became quite active in keeping African Americans from the polls. So my, my only point being is that this, this notion, this battle between what is the role of the federal government, which is not really a radical enlightenment idea, which was more decentralization, what role does that have in actually enforcing a more egalitarian version of society. And it's fat, it plays out and is relevant for almost everything happening today. I mean, I'll give you one good example of where this plays out. I mean, you see, today we talk a lot about the fact that 19 states have enacted new voting regulations and the governors of those states have signed those bills under the auspices of election security, of stopping fraud. And it, it may be true that I've, I've looked at many of these bills. There are measures that might make it more secure to vote. But once again, it's important to bring in facts, data, and history because so much of voting regulation laws in the US, like, like in the period I'm speaking about, were actually, of course, voter suppression efforts. So teasing apart how much of these laws is about, how many elements are about a more secure voting system and how many are making it harder for certain people to vote that requires some analysis. But my point being is that the history is very relevant for this debate today. Yeah, it's fascinating. So I have two questions that come to mind in analyzing how this schism developed over the course of American history. My first would be about the role of political parties in sort of uh, carrying forth these two polls and serving as organizing institutions uh, within these two schools of thought. Um, how did political parties develop and what's the role they've played over the course of this American schism and where we are now when we live in such a polarized binary between Democrats and Republicans? Well, so, so there's actually been, political parties are very important and they've been uh, helpful, but also quite destructive. And I, I go through this in the book. I think of course, Washington in his farewell address warned us about political parties because these two camps, the schism actually formed the two political parties that started the country after the, after the constitution, the Federalists, which were, what was the Hamiltonian party and Jefferson Repu Jefferson's Democratic Republicans. And Washington watched how dysfunctional this had become and was quite worried about it for the future of our country. But what I will say is that it's very important to look at this, and the book does that, because 
the parties were very are very fluid. There's been a lot of movement. You know, one of the chapters that I discuss in the book is about the emergence of the populist party in the 19th century, the end of the 19th century, that came out of the Farmers Alliance. And, and what, why exactly did this third party arise and what was its purpose? And ultimately, of course, the, popular, the People's Party failed, but some of its ideals and principles ended up being adopted by both the Republican and Democratic parties as part of the progressive era. So presidents like Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, one Republican, one Democrat, actually built on some of the reforms that originally the People's Party was arguing for. So there's been fluidity. Of course, you know, of course, in the the Republican Party used to be the party of uh, of freedom for the South, and the Southern Democrats were traditionalists. That changed a lot. I talk in the book, for example, about how the evangelical Christian community. Um, had been fairly democratic, but, but really abandoned the party after Jimmy Carter and why? What, what was it about the of faith that brought that party closer you know, to align with the Republicans? So my point being political parties are important as sorting mechanisms to like, voters cannot be informed on every issue. So they usually associate with a candidate who has an ideology. But I also argue in the third part of the book, which is where I talk about how to move forward, how to get out of the morass that we're in. I argue that the two political parties in our country have become a monopoly and it needs to be broken. There's a great book by uh, Catherine Gale and Michael Porter called The Politics Industry. And it shows how the whole uh, money structure, lobbyists, lawyers around the two political parties are so plugged in that it's, it, really is, it really is not conducive to innovative problem solving. And uh, I think there were some very easy solutions to fix that. So what I do in the third part of the book, and I, I think here, and this comes because I'm a business guy and my whole career I've been, you know, I'm focused on solving problems. I try to lay out a path forward that has two fundamental parts. One, a structural changes that we need to break out of some of our problems today. And the other is a set of mindset changes about how we talk to each other. Because I feel like, uh, and there are many reasons for this, which I go into, our political discourse is no longer productive. We have to regain a respectful, productive form of debating issues. Absolutely. And I think that ties nicely into uh, Braver Angels. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about where we are currently and where we might go. But before that, I just have one more historical question that I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask. And that is the, the role that uh, power hierarchies, uh, particularly racial hierarchies, have played in the development of this schism. Because obviously both the, the moderates and the radicals uh, were developing their ideas in which the uh, racial and for that matter, gender hierarchies were simply assumed, right? right? Uh, you know, it, it was white men at the top and there was uh, chattel slavery. Yes. Um, and, and over the course of history, oftentimes um, people's ideals came into conflict uh, with their realities in terms of what, what, are their, what is their allegiance to a racial hierarchy versus their allegiance to uh ideals so it's a broad question but as you were researching this book how did how did your thinking about the the role of race in american history uh which has become such a divisive topic in itself you know with the 1619 project that's trying to centralize uh slavery and sort of the more uh radical you you could say adherence of 1619 that sort of uh, reject even the Enlightenment uh, right. as sort of a, a fundamentally damaged concept right. because of racial hierarchies. And then you have people who are pushing back and saying that, you know, the 1619 Project is uh, just trying to fundamentally uh, criticize America as rotten from its very core. And, uh, you know, we're seeing this historical divide play out now in school boards across the country yeah. because it touches upon what do we teach our history, uh, our children about the history of the United States. So I'm just curious, um, sort of going in and over the course of uh, the research, I'm sure this question kept returning. And, and how do you think about its role in the schism? Well, 
you, there's a lot in, in that question. I, and I'm glad you bring it up. It's, it's, it's fundamental and central. There are two things I should mention. First of all, I believe looking at history from many perspectives is important. And, and I believe our country is, is great. I'm a kind of a product of the American dream, but I also believe we have to recognize our, our flaws and we've, we've had a lot of them. And, but so, so it's, it's a mixed bag. Now, what I, what I say is that there are two things that you got to remember. It's, I think it's inarguable that slavery was the contradiction of the American revolution. I mean, here you have this incredible declaration of independence that says all are created equal, all men. And I argue in the book that Jefferson really meant all people because the founders knew they were very cognizant that slavery was not consistent with the ideals. And somehow at that point, like, you know, how today we think one of the hot button issues that in society is immigration. We, 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 we have trouble talking about it. Well, even more so, in my view, from the history and research I've done, that was slavery during the founding. They thought it would somehow go away. It's not mentioned in the Constitution, practically. It's kind of amazing. So that was kind of the elephant in the room, for sure. And, and I think what ended up happening, the other important thing to point out is while you have this radical moderate split, a, a third force came into play after the constitution, which is the role of faith. And sometimes, and this happened with the second great awakening, sometimes the, this faith-based movement had wonderful uh, elements to it. For example, it was the second great awakening starting in like the 1890s that actually brought women into this conversation for the first time. Women didn't play much of a role in the revolution, but they did in, in, in because in the Second Great Awakening, it was the women who went to these, these revival meetings while men were working. And they, they developed a voice for not only temperance, because there was a lot of alcohol being used at the time, but also probably more importantly, abolitionism took off. So faith ends up playing a huge role that can be both positive and negative. Now, that's, an, that's this third force that comes in all the time in the book. So uh, you've, of course, racial hierarchy and hierarchical society is a, a fundamental force. And um, I think the issue of faith and how it impacts people's thinking about their ideals, about their values is of course also very important and chronicle through the book. Um, there's a lot of very interesting anecdotes I could, I could talk about. I, th I think what happens today is uh, people tend to get very hung up on labels and, and you know, of course labels are important. I, like, I use radical and moderate enlightenment and I define them because I think, I think that's important. I think that anyone who wants to throw away the importance of for example, a character like Thomas Jefferson, who of course is very controversial. If you see only one side of Jefferson, you're missing an awful lot. He was one of the most brilliant, uh, important figures in our history and, and really is responsible for, for, in many ways, for creating our nation. But he, he also had flaws like all, all do. And at his, in his time, it, it, I guess what, what I, the way I put it to your listeners, if you try to use today's value system to, uh, to uh, impose that on our founding fathers or historical figures, you're always gonna come up short. That, that's, that's not a, always a healthy mechanism to evaluate contributions to history. Of course, all historical figures have flaws and that we need to be addressed. But to say that the American Revolution uh, in 1776 through the period, which was also linked to the French Revolution, it was a worldwide movement which had a, a fundamentally powerful notion. It was about self-government and it was about the notion that having a noble title didn't entitle you to a, a future. And if nothing else, the Declaration of Independence is the most radically enlightened document that's ever been written in history. And, it, it's, it's, it, and the founders knew that and the ideals laid out were certainly not arrived at or not achieved, if you will, in the first phase and in other phases. The question is, are we getting closer? Are we moving? Mm. Is the arc of justice moving in the right direction? I mean, one of the chapters that, that's also in the book is about how it was that Lincoln in, at, at Gettysburg in his, in his second inaugural, of course, his fundamental thesis was, look, 
we have this great credo. It's called the Declaration of Independence. It's made us very successful. It's also created, uh, we, we also have a, a charter for implementing it, which is flawed. It's missing, it's not concluding everyone. So we've got to do some work to improve it. And my version of uh, of this today, in, in terms of the question you ask, I'm sorry to go on, but it, it's it's complex, is that both extremes, the left and the right, are missing, are, are, are destructive in that they're, they're not representing a balanced point of view. In other words, my research in the book shows that 77% of Americans are part of what I call the frustrated majority, meaning they believe that the extremes on both sides are drowning out their voice and that we have in fact more in common than not, but, it, but and they believe in compromise. But the notion of throwing everything out because as, as sometimes folks who are associated with critical race theory or 1619, you know, that, that's saying that all of our structures have been barbaric is ridiculous. And the folks who say that our, our democratic republic has been perfect, that's also not true. So the, the answer is, is dealing with our flaws and moving things forward towards improvement. It's about, it's like a glass half full, half empty, half empty. And so that's my perspective that it's the, it's the frustrated majority and the reason why I enjoy my work with Braver Angels, as you know, I've done some different book groups, is that I think many of, of the, the, the people who are involved in Braver Angels all over the country are in fact these heroes who are recognizing that we can't keep shouting at each other on Twitter. That's not gonna solve problems. That we need to get in a room and understand. You know, the third part of the book I mentioned talks about a mindset change, Kieran. And I, I, I set this up around some basic questions that, that, are, that are asked. And one of them is, are we really committed to a representative democracy, a government of the people? And, and, and what does that maintain? What does that require? Because there's a professor at Harvard, Daniel Allen, who talks a lot about what's required in, in a democracy. It's hard work and, and it, 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 we've gotta be committed to it, but it's also, in, like, for example, in an autocracy, edicts get handed down and people follow them or not. Democracy requires that we listen to each other and learn from each other. And what I, the point I make in the book, and I try to illustrate this, is that we've done best in our history when we've, we've, we've used our differences, even when we've had vast disagreements, when we've used it to actually talk to each other and compromise. At other times we haven't, and we we had things like the Civil War. And I would argue that in recent years, what's happened is that the our public debate, the rational and reasoned part and compromised part of our debate has been crowded out by acrimony and rancor. So they, they've replaced the notion of reason and facts. And that's part of the problem. Now look, disagreements, uh, ideological political debates have always been a mix of facts and, re and reason and emotion. But I think I make a strong case that emotion has now crowded out rational thought. And, and there's no better example than the immigration debate today, if you want to go into it. Right. Well, I'm hearing sort of three dimensions that shape our current political reality and, and may be right for reform, uh, structural, cultural, and what you might want to call epistemological, which touches on your, your last point. So starting with the structural, obviously there are structural features um, of our democracy that seem, um, at least on the surface, to sort of enforce the moderate view of things, guardrails, um, you know, yes. things that some would say are intended to uh, protect the uh, minority from the tyranny of the majority. Yes. Uh, others would argue that, in fact, the 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 true um, reason for many of these structures was to protect hierarchies. Um, right. So, for example, if you think about the filibuster, yes. um, you know, people will say, well, this is to protect, um, you know, the rights of rural states and the rights of political minorities. And others will say, but let's look at the history. This was really used as a way to protect Jim Crow. Right. Um, there's all sorts of features like that. The Electoral College, for example, which has its own interesting sort of uh, somewhat random history of development. Obviously, the Electoral College is not prescribed in the Constitution, uh, but it's led to a reality in which more and more 
um, you know, the, the winner of the popular vote can end up losing right. uh, the electoral college vote. And so you sort of get that schism in stark relief uh, right. between pure democracy and right. um, this sort of more uh, institutional democracy. So starting with the structural issues, what do you see as some of the reforms uh, that we might make that could serve to uh, depolarize and uh, sort of, you know, seed the ground for a, a democratic uh, reinvigoration. Great. Well, this is again discussed in the book, and let me give you some examples. I think first, the first thing before we get into what structurally I recommend changing, you have to remember that the founders, the framers of the Constitution, recognized that they would never be able to foresee all the potential issues with the Republic, as they describe in the Federalist Papers. That was the reason they made it malleable. The, fam the frame is intended for the Constitution to be modified every generation. A and I think that in and of itself is interesting because it's turned out that the amendment process might be too rigorous for, for, for that to happen. The last time we've had a meaningful amendment was in the 70s. Uh, so that's the, but, but the notion that the framers wanted to, to allow the Constitution to adapt to times is a fundamental premise. Now, there are many examples of structural things that have, were, but may have been put in place for uh, a purpose and are now outserve that purpose. Two of the ones I recommend in the book, which we can discuss, are term limits, and I can explain why that's important. And another one would be, um, uh, I think, campaign finance reform, if you will, uh, which is, it, it, it's clear that money has become, <laughs> Is, is dominates politics to such a degree today, much farther beyond what our founders imagined. So let, let, let me take, uh, and, and this, the book goes into detail, but you know, there's probably a third I should mention, which are, are, are is, is the two party lock. That's a structural change. So one example I give in the book is for our, in our fe in federal political elections, third parties have mostly been spoilers in recent years. A third party comes in and they take candidates from one party and the other one wins. Well, there are very simple structural forms which are actually getting adopted at local levels that change that. One is, is uh, you know, multi-party voting or ranked choice voting. It's, it's actually a fascinating, it's such an easy concept to, to, when you think about it. So ranked choice voting, what you do is now you can have five or six candidates running and there are no spoilers because the voter lists their choice. And if their first choice gets thrown out in the first round, their second choice counts. Now, now think about that for a second. It's, it's shown that, that ranked choice voting actually better reflects the desires of the populace because you're getting to, if, you, if your candidate doesn't win, you get another vote. So it's a much better structure, but yet we still have this two-party lock. So that's an example that, of a structural change that might bring fresh ideas into the debate and break this two-party monopoly. That's, that's one structural change. Uh, I mentioned term limits. So there are pros and cons to term limits, and I discuss them in the book. But I argue that because so much energy and money at the federal level is now spent by Congress people and senators getting reelected, that that's, that's outweighed the time they spent on solving problems. And that's absurd. The, pur the purpose of public policy is to solve problems, but yet the purpose of our public servants now is to get reelected, and that there's something wrong there. So you know we have we have something in the private sector, and this is again an example where I think my private sector experience is relevant. It, it, it's it's a notion of renewal. In other words, in almost any private sector job, if 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 someone's in a job for more than a handful of years and they get really good at it it's probably time to move on to another job <laughs> because people get stale. You need refre refreshment. Now, what I argue is obviously it takes some time to become a good legislator. And so you don't want really short-term limits. But on the other hand, at some point, when an, a, a legislator is in power for decades, there invariably there's cronyism and it, it's, it's not healthy for the democracy. So I argue for 12-year limits. And the point being, if a legislator can't get really good at legislating in 12 years, they're probably the wrong person for the job. But so, so I think term limits is something we really have to consider. 
And I even think it's relevant for the Supreme Court justices, which I, I discuss in the book. So those are two mm. examples. I want to, I could keep going on and on, but, but so they, they relate to your question about what are the structural changes that I recommend and why? Right. Well, so the second dimension, the, the cultural dimension, the psychological, the interpersonal, that's obviously something Braver Angels engages with a lot. It, it's ultimately a question of of how we treat each other. And, right. and uh, do we, are we making decisions about our behavior based on goodwill and common appetite for solutions or based on fear and demonization and, and zero sum thinking? So I want to ask about the historical perspective on culture, um, because I imagine the just as the pendulum has swung back and forth between moderates and radicals on ideology, so too has it swung back and forth in terms of how civil our politics yes, has been. What, what has the temperature been? What is the level of rancor and vitriol? Right. Um, you know, I think sometimes people will pine for oh, I wish we could go back to a, a more uh, civil day. But I think if you look back in history, throughout history, uh, politics has been pretty rough. You know, uh, the, the two sides have been lobbing insults at one another. Uh, you know, before the Civil War, uh, one senator attacked another with a cane. Yes. Uh, if you think back to the, the civil rights movement, obviously there was the, the nonviolent movement, but so too was there uh, radical movements, there were bombings, there was political assassinations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do you think about sort of the, the evolution of the, the cultural tenor in American democracy? Um, and sort of underlying this, of course, is the propensity for, for violence, right? Yeah. Our, our history yes. has been so violent. Um, and, and we've seen that cropping up recently. So it's a broad question, but I'm, I'm wondering, what is your historical understanding of that? And then how does that inform uh, how we might move forward in trying to choose, you know, conversation and engagement over alienation, dehumanization, and violence? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it's so important because once again, many Americans think that, oh, society is so divisive today, it's so bad. But as you point out, when you look across our history, we've had many episodes like this. In fact, the rancor between the Federalists and, and the, the Republicans was quite, was quite um, loud then. And they didn't have the internet, but they had pamphlets. They had a lot of yellow journalism and pamphlets they would use to attack each other. So there's no question that there have been elements of, of, of what we see today in terms of division and acrimony at many points in our history. And then it, it, it shifted. There are times when we've come together, often in the face of a foreign enemy. It's, uh, that's, made, that's been one of the factors where we've been able to unite and, 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 and it's seemingly our, our political tenor, cultural tenor and politics seem to be a little bit more uh, reasoned. And what I do in the book is explain that I think we're obviously when there is a, a back and forth, and we've made most progress when we've not taken the violent route. And but but that doesn't mean that we don't uh, listen to the points of view that are out there. So, for example, you know, we a lot of people talk about you know January sixth as an explosion of this anger, this violent uh, overthrow uh, against uh, our government. Well, there were many other uh, attempted overthrows of government over the course of our history. I mentioned Shays Rebellion, there was the Whiskey Rebellion, they're different, of course, but history is, is relevant. So what I would say to your question is, I think we've gone to, I mean, we think we've gone to the point, not of no return, but where we have to modulate our, our rancor and our, the way we talk to each other back towards a more civil pace. And that's why I love Braver Angels. That's what you committed to doing. I think one of the things that's keeping us from doing that is the media environment, which sensationalizes, you know, the extremes. And there are structural things that can help there. But it starts with how we talk to each other. And so mm. as an example, you know, one of the movements that I'm involved with is, is called Fight Unreason with Reason. And the point is, as I said to Tucker Carlson when I, I was on his show, that I'm willing to talk to any point of view, but we have to reject ad hominem attacks and we have to reject violence. And if you look at our history, when we've done it that way, we've made more progress than not. And 
um, there are many examples I use in the book, but one is immigration. So, you know, eight years ago, the Gang of Eight on the Hill had a very comprehensive solution for Im immigration. It addressed many parts of the immigration puzzle. Now, it was far from perfect. People on the left thought that it had things like quotas and weren't for it. People on the right were furious that it had a pathway to citizenship for, for dreamers. But my point is, it was a comprehensive framework that was based on compromise. And now after eight years of yelling at each other, build walls, open borders, we're much further away from a solution than we were then. These are real mm -hmm. problems that require compromise. So we can keep yelling at each other. We can keep using uh, um, rage and treating it like, a, like it's a, foot, a political football, or we can look at the data and, and start to build something which is a compromise. What history shows in America is that we've been much better off when we've done the latter. Hmm. Yeah, you, re you, you mentioned reason versus unreason, fact versus fiction. Um, I think that's a good segue to the kind of the last dimension I mentioned, the, the epistemological dimension. And, and I think it's a good point you mentioned in thinking about the factors that contribute to the level of rancor. You mentioned the media, uh, I would mention technology as well. Yes. Um, this this last issue sort of wraps around everything. It wraps around how we talk to one another. It yes. wraps around structure, and that is uh, what what is our shared reality? What, right. what is the 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 set of underlying uh, facts and assumptions and evidence and understanding that shapes our debate? And that's a something we hear in our workshop all the time. People say, well, you know, I'm happy to talk to the other side, but we can't even agree on, on what the facts are. Right. And um, it, it ultimately becomes a, a question of trust as yeah. well as reason, right? Yeah. Because we can use a reason and critical thinking to evaluate uh, what we trust, but right. trust is also very much shaped by emotion and community. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder how you think about that. I'll, I'll give a quick example, right? So I believe that climate change is happening, right? Why do I believe that? Is it because I go outside with a thermometer and I'm you know, measuring the temperature every day and I've created my mo own model? No, it's because I trust uh, the scientific consensus, which is communicated to me through channels of information that I trust. Correct. However, if for whatever reason you don't trust those sources of information and you feel like those sources of information are duping you or are in the pocket of special interests that are more inter uh, interested in profit and power and influence than uh, providing objective basis, then the rational thing to do is not trust right. those institutions. Um, and so, you know, every survey shows that the level of social trust in America is declining. And we know that low social trust corresponds with uh, higher polarization. And, and it's sort of logical to think that the less you trust your neighbors, the more likely you are to um, excuse or tolerate uh, violence toward them. So what do you think are some of the reforms that we might consider uh, to, to grow trust and through growing trust, re-embrace reason? It's, it's a wonderful question, Kieran, and we could spend a whole podcast on this. It, it's a fundamental issue. And some of the work that influences my, my thinking a lot and did in the book is the work of Jonathan Roach at the Brookings Institute and his book, The Constitution of Knowledge. He describes that the way uh, we've built this constitution of knowledge is through decentralization and through not what I believe or what you believe, but what we believe. And it's based on always a, a bunch of fundamental rules and premises. One of them is you have to be willing to see that you're wrong. And, it, and, and one of the ways knowledge is built is by hypothesizing things that turn out to be proven false. So the way this works is that it's almost like a funnel the way I think Raj describes it. Anyone can lob ideas in the top of the funnel because it's broad. So that's, that's good because it's egalitarian. But then you have things like, as it goes down the funnel, you have peer review, you have testing, 
You have expertise that's looking at it. You have transparency. So what, what comes out is knowledge on the other side has gone through the rigor of a process. And that's why it, it, it's robust. And even then it's true until not proven true. So I, I couldn't describe in detail how this all works, but it requires our institutions to have processes it requires decentralization, but also expertise. And uh, uh, it served us very well if you look at the objective facts. Like, you know, we, we've developed vaccines that, that have solved viruses, for example. We, so, and I'm convinced, by the way, to, 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 to just put my, my cards on the table, that the constitution of knowledge structure that we've built over a couple of hundred years holds the answer to a lot of our problems. We, in fact, if we use that, we'll come up with solutions to climate change. But what worries me, and one of the reasons I took this three-year hiatus to work on this book, as I mentioned at the start, was that I feel like too many Americans are discarding it. You, science and objective truth matters. And I think what's interesting, Kieran, is that you hear so much online from you know, conspiracy theories and, and both extremes. You have canceling on the left and trolls on the right. 77% of Americans know that science matters and believes that scientists are doing incredible work and believe doctors. So it seems that everyone's throwing truth away. But my argue in the book is that there's, it's actually the fringes and there's a core that still uses our constitution of knowledge as its foundation. And that holds the answer to our problems. Hmm. Well, and I would say, too, that it's really technology that have empowered the fringes to drown out the, uh, you know, you call it the frustrated majority. majority. I've also heard it called the exhausted majority yes. um, in, in various reports. And I'll also say that, you know, we love John Rausch at, at Brave Angels. He was actually one of our founding board members. And, and his thinking, I think, has influenced ours as well. Right. Um, so I guess my last question, because we have to wrap in a couple minutes here, is if the constitution of knowledge is so important, how can we rebuild people's trust in the constitution of knowledge when they feel like it's failed them? They feel like maybe they have less opportunity than before. They turn on the news. All they see is, is demonization. Um, how might we rebuild people's trust in these crucial institutions. So, so what's happening is that we're conflating or confounding two different things. One is the fact that our neoliberalist policies of the last several decades have benefited some and been really painful for others. And there's been a lot of suffering in society because of uh, what we thought was preparing ourselves for a global capitalist structure. And that's, again, a whole discussion in itself. And that's why, the, you know, the book talks about this. That's why there's so much mistrust and anger. It's justified. The establishment has left out many Americans for too long. But we're conflating that valid set of grievances and frustration with the notion of epistemological truth. And they're two different things. And one of the way, reasons we're doing this is because we're, you know, we, we all, as human beings, we all have these fundamentally important primitive drives driven by our amygdala, you know, being with the in-group and, and screaming at the out-group. And, and we all know this because if we've ever been in a sports arena, it's a wonderful feeling. To, it's really reinforcing. And we're not controlled by, we're not control of it. It's, it's primitive. What I point out in the book and, and explain is that, that it's important for humans to have those emotions and it's very valid for the sports arena, but it's no way to make public policy. And we're trying to use this framework of screaming at each other to solve problems. And that's the mismatch. That's the mismatch. The anger and the distrust that you're pointing out is very true and there's a, there's a reason for it. Both parties, both of the established parties have shown the white working class tremendous disdain and ignorance. And you know, of course, Trump was able to very much tap into that, but their grievances are very based on real things and uh, policies that have left them behind. I'm, when I say them, I'm talking about working class Americans really of all races, as, as the 1%, the to use the left's term, has gotten richer and taken more. So, that, so we have to understand the, the two sides of the dilemma you're posing. One is about why is this there this mistrust, this anger, this rage? And the other is 
Why is it directed at our institutions? And how did that happen? You know, I would love to do, for example, I would love to do a podcast with, with I'm actually speaking to, to Jonathan later today. It'd be so much fun to do a discussion with him about this. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've ever done a podcast for, with him or I would love to, to, to chat about this because that's, I think, what's happened today. And we probably don't have time to go into the solutions, but I think you're hitting on the fact that technology, the way it's designed is helping the, the extremes. And there, there again, are, are simple ways. We could incentivize, for example, different things than whoever gets the most clicks. There are ways to incentivize other things in the media model. Doesn't mean the government has to take over information, but it means we can change the incentive structure. And I discussed some of those in American Schism. Hmm. Well, I think that's a good point to end on. I think yeah. we've surfaced lots of different issues that could uh, you know, merit their own conversation in itself. But I think this was a good place to start to start getting our listeners and anyone else who's interested in this topic, thinking not just about the current moment, but really thinking and understanding how history has gotten us to where we are. Um, exactly. So, Seth, I would love one second. I would go just ahead. Love to, I would love to just tell your listeners that I. You know, one of the things I really enjoy is the, the talks that I've done with Brave Angels folks, and I'm happy to um, hear from listeners. So there's a site, AmericanSchismBook.com, which explains the, the book a little bit, of course, but it also has a way to get in touch with me. And I would love to hear from your listeners. It's American Schism, is S-C-H-I-S-M, book.com. Got to put a plug in for that. And uh, again, I, I would love um, to hear from, from interested listeners uh, and readers about their questions and their concerns. It's one of my, the real reasons that I've done this is for interaction and, and learning. Definitely. And so too do we at the Braver Angels podcast always want to hear feedback from listeners, criticism, compliments, questions, suggestions. We take it all. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe. You can shoot us an email at media at braverangels.org. And once again, our appreciation to Seth for coming on and we will see you soon.